Chapter 6, Worlds in Collision, The Reconquista and the Crusades. Europe's peasant population grew rapidly, both in the old territories and in newly settled lands. The noble population though, grew even faster. Noble mothers, who are more who ate more meat than peasant women, who ate mostly cereals, produced children who were more likely to survive the dangers of childhood diseases. The result was an ever-increasing number of ambitious, often aggressive young noblemen. They were a force to be reckoned with, as the sons of Tancred de Hauteville pro proved. Tancred was a minor noble in Normandy. He had twelve sons, first by his first wife and seven by his second. He almost certainly had daughters as well, but we know nothing about them. Their names and deeds were not recorded. The sons, though, made their mark in history. By law, only the eldest son could inherit Tancred's small ancestral estate, so the others set out to seek their fortunes elsewhere. Three of the brothers, William Iron Arm, Humphrey, and Drogo, became warriors, fighting sometimes as mercenaries for pay and sometimes as bandits for themselves. Meanwhile, the new religious feeling sweeping across Europe had made pilgrimages to sacred sites popular with people of all classes, and the warrior brothers decided that they too should visit the holy city of Jerusalem in the late 11th century. On the way, they discovered that Sicily and southern Italy were fine places to practice their military skills. The Arabs and the Byzantine Greeks were fighting each other in those places, and both sides hired mercenaries. Soon the remaining de Hotville brothers had joined their kin, and the brothers began recruiting armies and carving out kingdoms of their own, rather than fighting for local factions. Two of them, Robert Guiscard, the fox, or the sly, and Roger, conquered southern Italy and the island of Sicily. When the Pope, with the Pope's approval in 1072, they founded a Norman kingdom there that was similar to the state that William the Conqueror had just established in England after his Norman conquest. The de Hotville family's ambitions didn't end there. One of their descendants, Robert's son Bohemond, soon impressed enemies and allies alike with his ruthlessness as a crusader and conqueror. Like southern Italy, Spain also offered opportunities for the younger sons of European nobility. The Christians of Spain, joined by fighters from other parts of Europe, waged a long war against the Moors, as they called the Muslims, who had ruled much of Spain since the early 8th century. In this fight, called the Reconquista, the Reconquest, warriors from the Christian states tried to drive out the Moors and establish their own kingdoms in the reconquered territories. The Reconquista is the subject of the Spanish epic poem El Cid. The poem's hero is based on a real person, Rodrigo Diaz, who was born around 1043 in Castile, a kingdom in north-central Spain. Diaz was a nobleman. His nickname, El Cid, means lord in Arabic, and the poem portrays him as a popular champion of the Christian faith. And forth to look upon him did the men and women throng, as with one mouth, together they spoke with one accord, God, what a noble vassal! But in reality he was an opportunist who fought both Christians and Muslims, plundering churches and mosques alike. Cross of the Sword the turmoil of the Reconquista attracted adventurers, and in the long run it loosened the Muslim grip on Spain. By the early 12th century, the Muslims were beginning to lose control of the area that had been the westernmost province of the Arabs' empire and one of its chief centers of learning. As Muslim power slowly crumbled, the Christian kingdoms of Castile, Aragon, and Portugal began to expand. The Arab world faced other troubles during this period. French and Norman nobles were creating new kingdoms and principalities, territories ruled by princes in Sicily, Sicily and Spain, eroding Arab rule. Meanwhile, the Seljuk Turks, a nomadic Central Asian tribe who had converted to Islam, were making inroads on Arab territories in the east. The Turks conquered Baghdad, the heart of the medieval Arab world, and then moved west. Turning their attention from the Arabs to the Byzantine Greeks, they defeated the army of the Byzantine Empire and gained control of Byzantine territory in Anatolia, part of modern Turkey. They renamed this region Rome, an adaption of Rome. The Turks' gradual conquest in the eastern Mediterranean brought Jerusalem and other parts of the Near East, modern Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Israel, Palestine, and Iraq, under Turkish control during the 11th century. This meant that Christians from Western Europe making pilgrimages to the holy sites in Jerusalem were greeted at inns and shrines not by tolerant Arabs, but by the Turks, who were less hospitable toward Christians. 
As a result, pilgrimages became more difficult and dangerous. Byzantine Christians who lived in the eastern lands complained to the western pilgrims and clergy that the Turks persecuted them. The Turkish conquest of Jerusalem and other parts of the remaining Byzantine Empire led to talk of the cooperation between the Byzantine Emperor in the East and the Pope in the West. Relations between the Byzantine and Roman churches were strained. Both considered themselves part of the same Christian faith, but they had clashed many times over the years over issues of religious practice, such as whether Christians should use two fingers or three to cross themselves, and over political issues, such as whether the Pope in Rome was dominant over the Patriarch, the head of the church in Constantinople. Finally, the two branches of the church had split. One became known as the Roman Catholic Church, the other as the Greek Orthodox. The Turkish threat, though, led the Byzantine emperor to call on the pope for help in defending Constantinople. The result was a clash of cultures called the Crusades. An explosive combination of interests, ambitions, and religious feeling gave rise to the First Crusade in 1095. Pilgrims complained that the Turks were harassing them. Merchants of Italian towns said that the Turks interfered with their trade and that the town's economies were suffering as a result. After the Byzantine army suffered a defeat at Turkish hands, the Byzantine emperor, Alexius Comnenus, wrote to the pope in consternation, asking the pope to send mercenaries to his aid, perhaps some of those fierce and footloose Normans. Alexius hinted that in return for such help, he would reunite the two churches. In 1095, at a council of French clergy and nobility, Pope Urban II preached a sermon that was a stirring call to arms to liberate the Holy Land, current Israel and Palestine. He flattered the nobles, praising their fame as warriors, and called on them to avenge the Christians in the East. Muslim Turks had killed Christians, destroyed churches, and invaded the Byzantine Empire. But, Urban declared, the French noblemen could aid their fellow Christians and reclaim the Holy Sepulchre, the tomb in which Jesus had been buried, from the Turks. The Pope also mentioned overpopulation in France and pointed out that instead of fighting one another for land and fiefs, Frankish warriors could go to the Holy Land and carve out estates there. This land which you inhabit, Urban told his listeners, shut in on all sides by the seas and surrounded by mountain peaks, is too narrow for your large population. He also promised that those who went on this holy crusade would be forgiven for all their sins and would be certain of going to heaven. Urban's audience responded with enthusiastic cries of, God wills it! But the Pope realized that too much enthusiasm would, not, would raise not an army, but an unruly mob. He cautioned that, We neither command nor advise that the old or feeble or those incapable of bearing arms undertake this journey, nor ought women to set out at all without their husbands or brothers or legal guardians. Let the rich aid the needy, and according to their wealth let them take with them experienced soldiers." clergymen were not to go without the consent of their bishops. Despite Urban's word of caution, his speech inspired a crowd of younger sons, peasants, poor knights, and members of the clergy. The Pope knew that Emperor Alexius Comnenus had asked for a mercenary army of knights, but Urban could not raise an organized army out of this ragtag assembly. He wanted to send an army led by a king or high-ranking noble who could be counted on not just to win the Holy Land from the Turks, but to place it under papal control. No king or major feudal lord, however, wanted to leave his own territory to pursue this far-fetched goal. Persuading the nobility to join up took some time. Finally, the adventurous and foolhardy Duke Robert of Normandy, son of William the Conqueror, agreed to go on the crusade. So did several other French and Norman nobles, including Bohemond, son of Robert Guiscard and grandson of Tancred de Hauteville. Crusade, Take One the First Crusade was really two crusades, a main army of knights and nobles and a popular crusade. The popular, meaning of the people, crusade was a mob of peasants and clergy led by an impoverished knight, Walter the Penniless, and a preacher, Peter the Hermit. According to the New Testament, Christ would one day return to earth and take his followers to join him in heaven. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, so that you also may be where I am. Walter and Peter's followers believed that the year 1100 would bring this second coming of Christ, and they wanted to be in Jerusalem when it happened. While the main army got organized, gathered supplies, and negotiated with Italian merchants for ships, the mobs set off by foot across Europe. 
Some in this group argued that they didn't have to go to the Holy Land to fight those who were not Christians. They could do just as well by attacking Jews in Europe. The first pogroms, persecutions in which Jews were rounded up, robbed, killed, and burned, occurred in the German city of Cologne. Most of the popular crusaders, however, continued through Hungary and the Balkan Peninsula. When they finally reached Constantinople, Emperor Alexius was so disgusted with them that he forced them to camp outside the city where they committed petty thefts. Eventually, the emperor agreed to ferry them across the Bosphorus, the waterway between Constantinople and Asia Minor. After the popular crusaders landed, the Turks attacked and killed most of them, although Peter the Hermit managed to escape to Constantinople. In the meantime, the main army of crusaders gathered in Constantinople. Relations between Emperor Alexius and the Westerners were not cordial. Anna Comaine, Alexius' daughter, left a fascinating account of how the Byzantines saw the crusaders. Anna claimed that the crusaders could not be trusted, writing, There were among the Latins such men as Bohemond and his fellow counselors, who, eager to obtain the Roman Empire for themselves, had been looking with avarice upon it for a long time. Anna was right about Bohemond. She described one time when her father invited Bohemond to a feast. Knowing that Bohemond would be suspicious, the emperor had his cooks bring raw meat to his guest and told Bohemond to have his own cooks prepare it if he preferred. In a generous gesture, Bohemond gave all the prepared banquet food to his followers. The next day he asked them how they were feeling to find out if the meal had been poisoned. They felt fine. Bohemond had been willing to risk their lives, not his own. Devious himself, he was suspicious of others. Such a man was Bohemond, wrote Anna. Indeed, never have I seen a man so dishonest. In everything his words are, as well as his deeds, he never chose the right path. And, as events would soon show, Bohemond was hungry for power. After many squabbles, Emperor Alexius and the Crusaders reached an agreement. He would supply provisions for their war against the Turks, and they would return to him the cities of Asia Minor that the Byzantine Empire had lost to the Turks. With Alexius' help, the Crusaders moved into the Turkish-occupied territory. They revealed their true intentions as soon as they captured the first of the Turkish-held cities. Instead of turning it over to Alexius as they had agreed, they made him pay for it. The Crusaders' resolve was tested in 1098, when they besieged the city of Antioch in modern Turkey. They spent the winter camping outside the well-fortified city. Emperor Alexius had cut off their supplies. As food grew short, their situation grew desperate. Finally, in the spring, an Italian fleet brought supplies, and the Crusaders prepared to renew their attack. One witness says that Bohemond suggested to his fellow crusaders, If it seems good and honorable to you, let one of us put himself ahead of the rest, and if he can acquire or contrive the capture of the city by any plan or scheme, let us with one voice grant him the city as a gift. But the clever Bohemond had already made a contact with a Christian inside the city walls, who let him climb up at night and open the gates for the crusading army. The crusaders were victorious, but their victory was short-lived. The Turks soon regrouped and sent a large force against the crusaders occupying Antioch. Now the Crusaders were trapped between the force of Turks who still held a castle in the city center and another force camped outside the city walls. Starving, they were reduced to eating rats. Bohemond saw one way out, an attack on the Turks outside the city. The Crusaders won the battle and Bohemond claimed the city for himself. Bohemond's claim so enraged the other nobles that the crusade ne nearly fell apart, but the leaders settled their differences and continued to their goal. Jerusalem, which they had captured in the summer of 1099. It was a terrible battle. One eyewitness said there was so much blood in the streets that it came up to the horse's knees. What, the noble creators, leaders of the crusade wondered, should they do with Jerusalem? The petty fighting and land hunger that had marked their earlier conquests seemed inappropriate in the holy city itself. In the end, they named the only nobleman who had come on the crusade for genuine religious reasons as the first king of Jerusalem. The First Crusade established the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem, as well as several other Near Eastern principalities, which were granted to nobles who had taken part in the great fight. One of those nobles, of course, was Bohemond, who finished the crusade as a prince of Antioch, a title he passed on to his descendants. And although the crusaders' conquest of the Arab and Turkish population had been bloody, as Christians and Muslims lived together, they became economically dependent on each other and shared many customs. Newcomers from Europe were often surprised by how well they got along. Colonizing Jerusalem and the surrounding lands had an enormous impact on Europe. 
The crusaders returned home with the better knowledge of building stone castles and the machines that could besiege them, a taste for more highly spiced foods, and an appreciation for luxurious silk and cotton garments. They also brought home many relics, items considered sacred because they were said to date from the early days of Christianity. These gains influenced life in Europe, even while more crusades surged eastward in the centuries that followed. In spite of their victories in the Near East, Europeans were always a minority there, in danger of being overwhelmed by the Arabic-speaking armies that sought to regain control of the region. Western Europe would have to make repeated efforts to keep Jerusalem in Christian hands. And now, um, turning back to page 93, there's some, an account of the First Crusade by Al-Ahir. So this is page 91. Ibn al-Athir, a Persian intellectual, wrote a history of the Muslim world from its beginnings until his own day. Born in 1160, al-Athir relied on earlier accounts of the events surrounding the First Crusade, which took place in the late 11th century. He did, however, have his own experiences fighting against the Crusaders, especially with the Turkish ruler Saladin and in the Third Crusade of Richard III. He wrote his history in verse, expressing great sorrow at the brutality of battle, but calling Islamic soldiers to defend their territory. We have mingled blood with flowing tears, and there is no room left in us for pity. To shed tears is a man's worst weapon when the swords store up the embers of war. Sons of Islam, behind you are battles in which heads rolled at your feet. Dare you slumber in the blessed shade of safety, where life is as soft as an orchard flower? How can the eye sleep between the lids at a time of disasters that would waken any sleeper? While your Syrian brothers can only sleep on the backs of their chargers or in vultures' bellies? Must the foreigners feed on our ignominy while you trail behind you the train of a pleasant life, like men whose world is at peace? When blood has been spilt, when sweet girls must for shame hide their lovely faces in their hands, when the white sword's points are red with blood and the iron of the brown lances is stained with gore, at the sound of sword hammering on lance, young children's hair turns white. This is war, and the infidel sword is naked in his hand, ready to be sheathed again in men's necks and skulls. This is war, and he who lies in the tomb at Medina seems to raise his voice and cry, O sons of Hashim! I see my people slow to raise a lance against the enemy. I see the faith resting on feeble pil pillars. For fear of death, the Muslims are evading the fire of battle, refusing to believe that death will surely strike them. Must the Arab champions then suffer with resignation, while the gallant Persians shut their eyes to their dishonor? May Almighty God show mercy to his soul and grant unto him forgiveness for his sins.